We're going to turn this morning to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. Then we're going to also look at Jeremiah chapter 2. Genesis chapter 26. Jeremiah chapter 2. Plan on being, I hesitate to say I plan on being brief this morning. I, sometimes that don't happen after I say it. But I believe I have a directive word this morning. Anybody know what a directive word is? That's direction, going forward. Amen. If you're in Genesis chapter 26, say amen. We're going to look in... Let's go ahead and begin reading in verse 1. It says, There was a famine in the land in addition to the first famine that was during the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I tell you. Let's look in verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and continued to prosper until he became very wealthy. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and great number of servants, so the Philistines envied him. For the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father by filling them with dirt. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are more powerful than we are. So Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called their names after the names his father had called them. I'm going to stop reading there. He called their names after the names his father had called them. I want to look quickly at Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. God is speaking here through the prophet Jeremiah, and he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. I want to speak to you just a few moments this morning about Redug wells, living water, and broken cisterns. Redug wells, living water, and broken cisterns. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your word. God, I thank you for the spirit that has been so evident in this place today. Lord, that you're touching hearts and lives in this house. Lord, let every word spoken today be straight from the throne of God. Lord, have your will, have your way. Lord, anoint us today. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what you would say to your people, and we will praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Redug wells, living water, and broken sisters. Most of you know by now that I was raised in Pentecost all my life. I tell you often I was born under the pew. 
Mom's here today. She may say that might be stretching it a little bit, but it's pretty close. It's all I know. I've told you before that I've been in it long enough and been in the presence of God and experienced the power of God long enough that the imitation no longer satisfies me. That I can't be satisfied with church as usual. Programs of men and routines of the ordinary. In Jeremiah chapter 2, it's quite an indictment to God's people when he says that my people have committed two evils. He didn't say that it was two things that they disagreed with me a little bit on. Or maybe a couple things that their opinion was a little outside of what I wanted. He said they've committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the Lord God, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn out for themselves cisterns, but not just cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. I don't mean to beat a dead horse or to harp on a certain subject, but there's never been a time when the church needed, that America needed the church to go back and redig the old wells. I'm not talking about being old fashioned. I'm not talking about dragging us back to the days of the Mayflower. I'm talking about back to the truth, the foundational bedrocks of the living God and His Word. I'm not talking about style. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about being relevant or not relevant. If you're, if you're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of His Spirit and delivering the fresh manna from heaven that is the Word of God, you will always be relevant to the society around you. You need to get that in your spirit. But God has a way that he played out and that he laid out. God has a way that will never change. God has a plan that is eternal. The schemes of men will never compare to the word and the power of God. When you walk in the power of God, when you walk and when you go redig the old wells, the fountain of the living water will begin to flow again. Cisterns, broken cisterns. I grew up in a little spot in the side of the road in Arkansas called Carbon City. It was named Carbon City because it was coal mines back in the day, Carbon. And up on the hill in Carbon City, my grandparents had a house on the hill, and they had another little house for the winter below the hill. And up on the top of the hill, right beside the house, was a cistern. Down below the hill, below the other house, was a well. And though they both had, a fl had water that you could water the gardens with, they were very different from each other. See, because we didn't use that city-bought water to water gardens with. You ain't spending money to water the garden. It means you're going to haul it. But below the hill in that well that you drop that long well bucket, and you hear it hit at the bottom. When you would pull it up and let it go, it would be almost ice cold on a hot summer day. It would be sweet and cool. And refreshing. I used to like to put my hands under it. I didn't die of anything, so it's all right. Don't even think I got sick ever. But up on top of the hill, there was a cistern. A cistern was something that didn't have a natural flow that my grandfather built, that he dug out by hand himself. And that he, that he mortared in and, and finished off. 
And there was gutters all over the house. Well, in fact, every building on the property, I think, had a gutter that ran to that cistern. A cistern didn't have a source other than runoff. It didn't have a source other than leftover. It was man-built with a man plan to fulfill a man purpose, and that was to water that garden under the hill with a water hose shoved down in it and siphoned that you didn't have to pay for. But along about this time of year, I remember, because uh, it was concreted in on the top, and it had a, a, about a two and a half by two and a half or so concrete form over the top to guard the big hole. It was pretty heavy. I couldn't lift it myself. But it had a little place in the side that you can just lift a cap off and drop a hose in it. But every once in a while in the summer, we would pull that top off. And about this time, well, a little earlier, it would begin to get full of frogs. And by this time of year, when you pulled the lid off, you knew that there was something down there that wasn't fresh. You couldn't see the bottom anymore. It was kind of green and scummy and stinky. Sometimes full of frogs, sometimes full of dead rats. So you're kind of gross. No, I want you to see what God's talking about. There was a water source there that you could, you could water, you could still water the garden with it, but you wouldn't put in your hands under the hose getting a drink because it was nasty, not good for much. God speaking to his people said, you've committed two evils. You've forsaken me, the living water, and you've built for yourself cisterns. The church has got to be called back to a time when the only water source that we're satisfied with is the fountain flowing from Emmanuel's veins. We've got to come back to a time where there's fresh water that flows. See, a cistern doesn't flow. A cistern just holds. I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender this morning. You say, well, you, you're that every week. <laughs> See, in the church world, we tend to have one group of people that don't have any standard at all, and whatever will draw a crowd, let's do that. That's a man-created source that will eventually become a stink in the nostrils of God. There won't be any life that flows from a created cistern. You know, all the people over, I'll say 48. All the people over 48 are happy right now because I'm talking about all the people under 40. But hold on just a second. I think it's the, oh man. Can't even, sometimes I really can't believe what I'm about to say. <laughs> he said, you've created for yourself cisterns and broken cisterns that can't hold water. It's usually a cistern that's been around for a while that gets a crack and starts to leak. Oh, I heard that. I heard a, I heard a groan on that. Talking about a cistern needs a little age before it begins to no longer hold water. There's not anything life. There's no life whatsoever. You can't even water the garden out of a cistern that's cracked and went dry. See, now that, I, now that everybody's mad at me, we can preach. See, it doesn't matter if you created it 70 years ago or if you created it last week. If there was no flow of living water in it, then there's not going to be any life that comes out of it. I've told you before that there's no more anointing in rust carpet and oak pews than there is, never mind. I saw just last week, now don't be digging through my Facebook, you're not going to find it. But I saw just last week a lady that I love dearly that got upset and, and, and threw a fit and left a group of preachers because somebody posted a video of a guy that stood under blue light. 
It went modern. Well, you know, I forget. You know that thing I said about being brief a while ago? Just forget I said that. It's not working out. I got, to talk to, I got to talk to everybody here for a minute for a church to grow and the church to grow, move forward and for God to, to be able to move and have his way. Do you hear me? Well, they went modern like that's apostasy. What's that mean, went modern? Well, it, it, it might mean that it, it could mean, well, it can mean a lot of things. What does modern mean? When I was at Grayson, I told you about when we went from window units and broken windows to new windows and, 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 and central heat and air, you know, we went modern. And I was very thankful for it. Because I remember my grandmother and talking about the revivals under the brush arbors and how God came down and they rolled in the sawdust and all that stuff. But you know what? God doesn't need sawdust to move or brush. I'm kind of thankful that he lets us sit under the air conditioning. So what exactly does it mean went modern? Did we go modern when we went out of the cathedrals at Europe to cinder block buildings and to wooden structures or to metal buildings? Is that modern? What does that mean? Went modern. Does it mean because we didn't sing all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Uh, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Does that mean we went modern? I got to steal something from my buddy Ron. Y'all say, what are you talking I'm getting there. Most of the time, what's happening in churches today, the upset comes over the container. We're talking about containers this morning. Broken cisterns or wells of living water. What are you talking about? In a church where we can't move forward, one person's over here pulling this way, holding us back on this side, and the other side's over here pushing us off the cliff the other way. Containers. Most of the time, what happens in a church, what we're divided over is the container. You don't know what I'm talking about yet. Oh, the container. Hey, this is a container of water. Y'all recognize it? Container is important. I, without the container, I can't get it to my mouth. Right? It'd be kind of hard to walk it up here if I didn't have something to put it in. Are you with me? Oh, I could have brought it out here in a red Solo cup that's sitting in there in the kitchen. It would have still held the substance. And it would have still got it to my mouth that it would have still been refreshing. It would have still had the substance inside. While we're arguing over containers, we're not pouring out the substance. Just water, it ain't going to stain this old carpet. <laughs> I come by to talk to you about this. It, see, we, we have a younger crowd that thinks if we don't do it this way, then, then we can't even be relevant. And we have an older crowd that if you don't stop doing what you're doing and do it the way we've done it 40 years ago, that you can't be relevant. And all the while we're arguing over if it's a cup or if it's a coffee cup or a glass or a plastic bottle, and all the while the substance is getting wasted on foolish argument. I was thinking about it this morning. I, my mind is just an inventory of church music. And we were singing last Sunday night. I think the song is called Take Me In. Is that right? Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Right? When I was a kid, we used to sing, I believed a true report. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I am past the outer court. 
Oh, glory be to God, I am all on Jesus' side, on the altar sanctified. To the world and sin I died, hallelujah to the Lamb. There's about three people that's heard that song. (laughs) And I truly was looking at those this morning. And I truly could look at it and say, what's the difference? What's the difference? Now it matters. Now I'm going to talk about the dreaded, say, why are you talking about worship again? Because it is the bane of the modern day church when people want to fight over worship. Church, if we're going to grow, if we're going to move forward, listen, I I don't like one-dimensional music. I've already told you that. I believe that we ought to worship across the generations. We ought to worship across the board. We ought to, if it's theologically solid and it's singable, then sing it. All of you, sing it. I've been reading the Bible where it says we're going to sing a new song. Some of you won't even be able to worship in heaven because you hadn't heard it before. You know why that was funny? Because it's true. Oh, I'm not for, I, I, I love where I came from. Can't live there. I'm not there anymore. I don't want to abandon everything that was ever taught me. I don't want to walk away, but I also don't want to, come to be a dinosaur walking through the door and people have to get an encyclopedia Well, they don't even use those anymore. That just aged me. They'd have to Google me to see what I was. Somebody had this over here. They said, what in the world's an encyclopedia? (laughs) Yeah, right. They give give you that by a a pill or a shot. Y'all hearing me this morning? Isaac was at a time when there was a famine in the land. Even living among the Philistines, God said, don't don't leave. We talked about this morning that there's power in obedience to God. He said, don't leave Egypt. Don't leave and go to Egypt. Stay where you are. And it said when when Isaac obeyed God that, that he planted and got a harvest in the same season a hundredfold that God blessed him. But he said... They got to have water. We've got to be sustained. And it says that, I, that Isaac told his servants to find the wells of my father. Find the wells of my father and redig the wells. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but there was three generations in that verse. Had Abraham that was gone. Abraham had found the wells. Did you hear me? Abraham had found the wells. The source of the water that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham found the well. He dug the well. He established the ways. A famine had hit the land and this generation was in trouble because there was no longer a source pretty bleak in the world right now we're in a famine word of God says there will come a time where there'll be a famine in the land and it won't be a famine of bread or of water but of the hearing of the word not any old wells would do if you'll read on in verse chapter 26 (coughs) they redug the wells of Abraham but they also dug other wells and every time they dug another well, they found, they found some water, but the enemy claimed it for himself and made them move on because it was, it was never theirs. They say, well, it was water. That's what we do today. Well, well, pastor, why can't we just sing that? Or why can't we just preach that? Why can't we just do that? Because it's not our well. It belongs to the Philistines, and they'll fight you for it. 
But he said they redug the wells of Abraham, and I want you to listen to me. Not only did they redig the wells of Abraham, they named them by the same name. Did you catch that? They redug the original wells and they called them the same thing. And they were blessed. Whether we are in a gym or under a brush arbor or we're in a brand new building, can I insert right here that no matter what it looks like when it's done, somebody's not going to like it. Come on, y'all here? If we paint the walls mauve and border it with pink roses, somebody over here is not going to like it and I'll be in their camp. (laughs) Just FYI. Or if we paint it black and God forbid had a, str- had a fog machine in it. Not, hadn't purchased a fog machine. Don't get upset. <laughs> but what I'm here to tell you is it, it wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Because if the economy fell apart, God forbid, and, you're, and every penny you had in the bank wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, that happens. Look at Venezuela, you'll find out. I bet we could meet and the Lord could fall under that roof out there just like he does all over Africa where I've stood on a slab and underneath the tin roof and the presence of God filled the place. We ain't going to argue over the container. Whether you're Abraham's generation, Isaac's generation, or Jacob's generation, We got to keep the well clean. We've got to call them the same thing. But I don't see anybody walking downstairs with a well bucket anymore. Are y'all hearing me? Are y'all thinking I'm crazy right now? Because see, if it was if it was now, my great grandparents would have. Well, my grandpa too, because he didn't spend money on such things. But my great-grandparents would have lowered the bucket in the well and pulled it up. My grandparents would have got a well pump that had a handle. And it would have been an improvement. This old guy's going to get an electric plug and plug it in and let it pump itself out. Because it's hot outside. And if it can get it out of the ground and get it to me, I'm good. I think y'all are hearing me. We'll dig the old wells and name them the same thing. Listen, I still believe in salvation by the blood of Jesus. I still believe that there's no other name under heaven whereby I must be saved. I still believe that outside of the, that outside of the cross, outside of the price he paid at Calvary, that there's no hope for mankind. That, that Muhammad's not going to get me there. Buddha's not going to get me there. All roads don't lead to heaven. It's still salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ. I refuse to give up the well of salvation, and I will call it what it is, the well of salvation. I still believe that ever since Acts chapter 2 when God's poured out his spirit upon all flesh and sons and daughters begin to prophesy, old men begin to dream dreams and young men begin to see visions and the Holy Spirit was poured out in his fullness that he still baptizes in the Holy Ghost today. He still initializes the initial physical evidence and still speaking in other tongues. I will not give up the well of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, not for you, not for me, not for anybody and I'll call it the same thing. I still believe that he went to a whipping post before he went to Calvary and they beat him half to death but didn't kill him and he shed his blood for my healing. That Jesus Christ is still the healer. He still, in, he does miracles, he does signs, he does wonders. He heals sick bodies. He, he still, the price is still played. The blood has not lost its power and I will still believe in divine healing. <laughs> 
Hey, we'll even redig the well that says that one of these days, any time now, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I still believe in the rapture of the church. I lost half the crowd. We need to redig the old well. We need to redig the old well. I remember growing up as a child and I thought if I don't repent right now, the Lord's coming back before he can even, before the preacher's done preaching. When's the last time we preached about the, re the, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ? He's still coming back. He's still coming back. It's not old-fashioned. It's not irrelevant. It is part of the fountain that flows of living water. We have a generation that needs, we have a generation, church, that we need to get over the container. Not worry about the container and redig the old wells and call them the same thing. We're not talking, we're not talking about style. We're talking about substance. A style is whether my suit lapel is two inches wide or four inches wide, whether it has three buttons or two buttons. We're not talking about that. Well, why not talk about that? Let me, let me park there a second so somebody else will understand me a little clearer. Somebody understand it this way. If, I go, if I'm going to go to Dillard's today and buy me a new suit, I used to wear one six days a week and don't anymore. It's hot down here. But if I did, I'm going to go buy what's in style right now. Right now. I'm losing people by the second. I'm going to go buy what's in style right I'm not going to go buy a suit with six buttons. Back in 1998, the more buttons it had, the better. I don't even know how they manufactured enough buttons. T.D. Jakes had, of course, he was tall and big. T.D. Jakes had 20 buttons on his suit. I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to buy a two-button suit with a narrow lapel, trimmed, trimmed closer with a double-tail vent. I used to sell suits, by the way, for Dillard's. I know all about them. Why? Because it's right now. But if I was, my mother-in-law used to say, if I was broke as Job's turkey, I would be pretty happy with a three-button suit rather than the alternative, which is I can't afford a new one, so it's a three-button or nothing. Somebody says, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about in Africa when a tin roof and a concrete slab is the, the very best they can do, be blessed with a concrete slab and a tin roof because they were really happy to get out from under the brush arbor. If 1963's rust carpet and red oak pews is, the, is, is, where the, is where people meet and that's what they can afford and it's the best they can do, guess what? The Lord will honor them and show up there. But if you, can, if you can have the best of the best of right now, then God bless us and we won't get caught up in the container. And guess what? The Lord will show up there. If the Lord doesn't show up there, it's nothing but man-made cisterns that are broken and won't hold water. But if the Lord shows up there, it'll be redug wells named after the, the original name with the original message that Jesus still saves, baptizes in the Holy Ghost, heals sick bodies, and it's coming again.
say, why do you preach these things? You'd have to ask the Holy Ghost about that. Evidently, we need it. Because I'd rather preach gumdrops and lollipops and streets of gold and gates of pearl. You never, I don't ever get that job. Church, he's here. He's moving. He's leading. The shape of the well ain't going to matter. It's the flow of the well that matters. It's that we haven't forsaken him who is the fountain of living water.